Hi, my name is James Sato. I'm the Vice President of Development Production for Diabolique Films, the CEO of HGB Entertainment Limited, and the producer of Herschel Gordon Lewis's Blood Mania, which you can see right now on Amazon Prime Worldwide or Vimeo On Demand. And to my right is... Hi, my name is uh, Terry Sherwood. I'm a classic film fan. Uh, I write a blog called Stardust and Shadows. I've had opportunity to work with some of the uh, classic film networks in the United States, including uh, TCM. I'm a drummer in a band called 13 Strikes. We play horror rock. And I'm a huge, huge reader of Famous Monsters of Filmland when it was uh, actually a magazine and not the way it is today, which is slightly a bit different. Um, over to you, Jim. That's about all I can say right now. Well, um, we have a long history of doing this together. Yeah. The first prize in this year's trivia contest is the only Roddenberry authorized 9-inch deluxe vibrator. As you can see, it's a Star Trek vibrator. And to go along with that, an 8x10 glossy of William Shatner. We hope you enjoyed our presentation of the last movie. Well, I, I did. I did. <laughs> I did, yeah. What's up no, next? Sir, no, seriously, seriously, for all the people that are probably sitting in their rooms right now saying, what are these guys doing on my screen? I've got to get more beer. Well, you go right ahead, because we're going to be having Forbidden Planet. Thank you, Terry. Enjoy Forbidden Planet. Next. We did. <laughs> Dr. McCoy, Uhura, and Scotty beam up to the Enterprise. What? It's not the Enterprise. It is a map. A different Enterprise. <laughs> <laughs> so what made you uh, decide to get back into uh, horror as a, a commentator, getting involved in a podcast? I've always, I've always had uh, a, uh, a love for uh, classic horror. Um, it comes through in my blog, Stardust and Shadows. Uh, there's a whole section in it called uh, The Chamber of Horrors which is devoted to mostly the 20s, the 30s, uh, the 40s, through to the silence. Um, I've been a huge fan of Hammer. I'm a Hammer film fan. Uh, saw most of them first release. I've seen uh, Night of the Living Dead, the original 1968, black and whiter, in the theater. Scared the bejesus out of me. Had a friend of mine with me named Ricky Pakulski. Honestly, that's his actual name who actually bugged me all the way home, walking pigeon-toed, scaring what little I had out of me that I didn't leave in the theater seats. Mm. So, horror has a, uh, a place in my life, a place in my heart, uh, even though it is still part of my classic film uh, interest. And why, Jim, perhaps, have you decided to grace this stage with your presence? Well, honestly speaking, um I'm in it for the uh, the hot podcast host pussy that uh, I've heard so much about. A actually, producer Patrick, can you cut us over to the live cam outside the studio? Let's see how many hot women there are out there. Fuck. Jim, why have you decided to uh, grace us with... Uh, this stage with your presence? I think uh, with myself, when I was young, I mean, we're talking like six, eight years old, I think there was only two channels on, on television at any given time in black and white. And even back then, I thought, well, you know, there's nothing really on late at night when I happen to be up, except usually a horror film, you know, the festival, the chiller theaters, the that kind of thing. And I think the first film I ever saw was The Ghost of Sierra de Cobra, which, yeah, it's, it's obscure. It sounds like a Spanish band. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's a, it's a made-for-television film, 1961, and uh, Martin Landau was in it. Okay. And I cannot find a copy anywhere. I've, I've searched, I've searched, uh, oh, eBay, Rare, Hong Kong piracy networks. Piracy is illegal. I remember uh, that. And, and the torrents. Piracy is illegal. And I can't find a copy of it anywhere. 
Um, and from there, like yourself, I, I got involved with, uh, well, Forey Ackerman's famous Monsters of Filmland. I'd, I'd go out every, every month and I'd grab myself the latest issue and uh, yeah, it, was, it, it kept me informed uh, all the time about the movies that I wanted to see. But unfortunately, you know, I grew up in Lethbridge, Alberta, where we met. And I think we only had five theaters or something, so. Was it five? Did they build an extra one? The Capitol, the Paramount, to it. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, it was, it was, I think there was five. But it was the Paramount that used to show their double features. Okay. Uh, horror on Saturday afternoons, and I saw films like The Oblong Box, and um, The Beast with Five Fingers. Five. And two rings. Five fingers. That, that, that one always killed me. I, I have, similar to that, for the films that, that I watched when I was in, I was born in Ottawa, and uh, they used to go to a place called the Rialto Theatre on Bank Street, and for, it was, at the beginning it was 25 cents. You could see four films. And it would have a theme, you'd have westerns, four westerns, or you'd have four horror pictures, uh, four science fiction pictures, like The Human Duplicator, which, I've wanted to see for years, and I still haven't seen it. I can't find it anywhere. That's another one of these mystery, mystery films. And I remember going there, and nobody would watch the film. You know, everybody would be screaming back and forth. Uh, I'd be the only one sitting there watching the premature burial. And uh, I didn't see the Oblong Box till actually a few years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, Follow the House of Usher. I'm sitting there eating the popcorn, which had about 10 gallons of salt on it. And I'd be watching it. Everybody else was running back and forth, getting orange drinks and cotton candy and all this kind of stuff and everything. I felt kind of, kind of odd about it. But I actually watched the films. Similar backgrounds here. I, uh, when you said The Human Duplicator, I've never seen it. But I, I, I just have an idea of a, a giant Roger Corman-like penis with a scowl on its face. Um, but that's neither here nor there. In 1963, he shocked and stunned audiences with his graphic and brutal portrayal of violence. Films like Color Me Blood Red, The Gruesome Twosome, and She Devils on Wheels changed the face of the horror film and earn him the name, the Godfather of Gore. Now, he returns with a sensational new horror anthology, Herschel Gordon Lewis's Blood Mania. Blood will flow. So what we want to do with our podcast is, is quite simple. We want interaction with you. Uh, we want you to send in emails. Uh, as we go along, we'll add in uh, chat rooms. We can add in phone-ins if you want, or Skype-ins. And uh, we'll have guests, um, several high-profile horror guests. And we've been advertising this for a little bit. And Patrick says that we have a question. Let me just check here. Okay. This is from Susan in Calgary. I have noticed in the modern era of horror that several popular horror movies slash franchises from the past either get remade, rebooted, or have prequels or sequels made. Studios seem to want to tap into what was once successful and repackage that and resell it to the fans. And in most cases, these attempts are not satisfactory. It would make sense if more independent and obscure films from my past that are only known by a cult following were remade. 
taking obscure forgotten films they may have gone, that may have gone directly to video and remaking them to reach a larger audience and breathe new life into that film to re-energize uh, re the genre. What forgotten classic films would you like to see get remade? You know, there's one I saw, and I will say it, it was on a streaming service. And I had wanted to see it again. Famous Monsters alerted me years ago to its existence. And you kind of try to find things. It's a picture called I Married a Monster from Outer Space, 1956, starred Tom, I think, Tryon or something. Thomas Tryon? Yeah, Thomas Tryon. He wrote, uh, ended up writing a book called The, the Others. Others. Yeah, it's the same guy. He did Western stuff and everything afterwards. But this was 1956. It fused rock and roll. It fused the 1950s ideas of marriage and what it was like to uh, uh, the woman's role in marriage, uh, the, the man's role in marriage. And that would be an interesting thing to do today, to mm -hmm. see how that would be handled by a female director. It would be really cool to see. You know, you get this, the aspect of what marriage is like. You know, I lived with the monster from outer space, <laughs> you know, as opposed to I had to marry him. Yeah, you know? yeah, I think well, that would be interesting. I was, a, I was in a common law union with... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, this, I know these are mostly... But would you contemporize it? Yeah, absolutely. I think you could do, uh, you could do some, some interesting things, an interesting look at, at marriage, at society, at the way people interrelate together. Uh, wasn't there that book, uh, Men Are From Mars? Women from Venus. Men from Venus. That, yeah, and I've never read it. Neither have I. But uh, I'm researching a title. You have that. Um, you have that aspect to it. Um, as a, I guess they used to lump these in in terms of the horror pictures. Um, one of my favorites was uh, the Monolith Monsters, 1955. Um, essentially, cheesy special effects for that time, with. Uh, these giant cylindrical rocks that kept w going straight up, dropping, and they were advancing on a town. And how they, for those who want to see it, it is available. I'm not going to tell you the ending, uh, but uh, it was a pretty cool ending to it. Uh, it involved seawater, uh, not like Day of the Triffids, but very close. And I always thought the script was very literate for that time. But uh, Monolith Monsters, I think, would be uh, an interesting title to, to make. First of all, it's in the desert, mm -hmm. which is kind of old school for uh, the horror picture. Um, it has, I guess you could say, interesting, uh, interesting science to it. It's got the law. It's got the rational professor. Uh, it had actually some very, very interesting uh, ways of looking at uh, society in small town. And uh, I think it'd be a really good remake. Like, make it in small town Alberta. Okay. Yeah. Well, what I was looking up was uh, a made for TV movie uh, from the 60s with Lloyd Bridges and Angie Dickinson called The Love War. Okay. And it's, it's not really horror as such it is. It was considered horror, it's classified as horror. But it's more of a science fiction story about uh, two people. Um, there's an intergalactic uh, battle that's going on for the Earth, and these two people fall in love, and as it ends up, she's a member of one of the warring races, and he's one of the other. Um, without giving away any plot endings or anything like that, I think that could be remade quite easily. Yeah, well, why would we make any of this stuff in the first place? You know, yeah. there's a thought, you know, uh, Robert Redford said, you know, for, you know, for every remake is done, there's a project, origi original project waiting out there uh, that doesn't get funding. And, uh, well, you know, I mean, it's, uh, do we have to, do we have to get obsessed with, uh, with remaking these things? Uh, remaking film? Hollywood has done it for, for years, mind you, they've had, uh, they're doing it now. 
but you're getting, when you remake a silent film into a talking film, into another talking film, which has been doing for years, uh, why are we doing this? Well, yeah. you know, it's the sad reality is it all comes down to money. Mm -hmm. And uh, greed really enters into it because when you could shoot a film, I mean, like, what was the, what was the budget on Ben-Hur? Today, I mean, which, if you put it into our dollars, well, the, the original. The Navarro version was 1926, or 1924. Well, yes, but. Cecil B. DeMille did that, Cecil, huh? Yeah. yeah. But uh, I mean, you know, so as, as costs go up, yeah. It just, you know, I mean, studios, if you look at a, a lot of the superhero films, mm -hmm. you know, for the kind of budgets they need, they have two or three studios going in. So if it does tank, mm -hmm. they each take less of a write down. So uh, money dictates everything. And you can have a great idea, but again, do the millennials want to see it? which is a huge factor, and is it going to make ultimately be profitable? They don't want to take a risk. So somebody puts on the Jason mask and they put on another killing spree, or, you know, there's a new Chucky movie. And I don't, you know, it's not necessarily a bad thing if it's, if it's well done and it's a beloved killer, but as you say, there's probably scripts out there, and a lot of the best stuff is being produced by pro indie right now. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you know, it, it'd be nice to see some people get a budget. I, I agree to a point on that. Um, I think what they do, and they do, I don't know whether they, they consciously go out and try to do a franchise, um, because you would get something like Jason, uh, you know, you put on the mask, kill, 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 another set of actors, kill, kill, kill. Did we make enough money to do another one? Oh, yes, we did. Mm -hmm. Do another one. Oh, did we make enough money to do number 10? No, we didn't. Let's go, yes, we do. We can sell them all together in a box set. Mm -hmm. Or they'll wait a sufficient amount of time and reimagine it. Yeah. Um, wasn't Jamie Lee Curtis making a return? Yes, there's another Halloween film coming out. And she's wearing the same clothes. Anniversary. She's wearing the same clothes. <laughs> <laughs> so I read somewhere she's wearing the same clothes. You know, like well, is maybe it the not same the, Shatner mask? Maybe <laughs> 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 it could be. You know, pulled out of retirement. Yeah, but I just well, I I don't know. It gets frustrating. I know they could become nostalgia shows for for people that have seen the original. And, True. You know, so you want to go back and you want to relive. You know, you're buying back your childhood. Okay, and well, Gus Van Zandt, remake Psycho. Shot for shot. Shot for shot, except the, yeah. him having a wank in the, in the, in the hotel bathroom. I didn't Was it see necessary? It. I didn't see it, sorry. I, I, I've only watched, uh, I only watched the Hitchcock one. Well, uh, I went back and I watched Psycho. Just the day before that I, I went to see the film in the theater, I rewatched Psycho for, I don't know, the 20th time. It was literally shot for shot, down to the license plate numbers on a vehicle being mm -hmm. exactly the same in the exact same shot. It was framed identical. Did Gus Van Zandt walk across the screen like Mr. Hitchcock did? <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, this, actually, uh, I didn't notice. Maybe he did. You know, maybe, he, maybe, he, maybe they CG'd in. There's another thing. CG'ing in, you know, the people, you know, and CG'ing in old Alfred walking when she stopped at the stoplight, you know, so... No, it's, and after a point, I, I just wish there was, they, they would take a chance a little bit more and maybe look at a, a well, I mean, original script, The Babadook. You know, whether you loved or hated the film, you know, it made money. I almost thought you said The Manitou. The Manitou. <laughs> the Manitou. I think there's like, you and I might be the only, and our beloved crew, might be the only people that have actually seen the Manitou. Um, I remember two scenes when the creature is coming out of the back of the person. Out of Karen Tandy's back. Yeah, yep. at the back. And one with some, one, an unnamed actress floating, like, like with this weird expression. 
on her well, face. Well, I, I didn't mind. Uh, well, I mean, again, you got Michael and Sarah as yeah. singing rock. Yeah. Um, and of course, Tony Curtis. <laughs> and uh, strangely enough, um, a fellow that I've gotten to know through social media is Graham Masterton, who wrote the novel. And I was trying to re-option the Manitou. Yes, I was mm -hmm. going to make a remake. But I figured it was time. And uh, ultimately, um, with all respect to Mr. Masterton, I, I couldn't afford to buy the rights now. Um, it is an exorbitant amount of money, as his barrister and solicitors told me. Oh, of course, yes. Um, and I really wanted to remake it. Mm -hmm. I thought in Canada, I mean, you know, it would be a, a great story. Yeah. Um, and you really wouldn't have, but then uh, again, I started to speak to, um, I handed out the script to some um, Aboriginal Indigenous actors that I know. And the notes started to come in. Well, this is wrong. This is wrong. It has to be modernized. That's wrong. And I thought, well, you know, if you're going to actually go and change the story that much, you're going to go into production and, and development hell because Mr. Masterton would want to make his revisions on the revisions that were made, and it's just, it's just a nightmare. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it may be that sometime down the road um, it might happen. I don't know. Uh, but it's not, you know, on my books, um, because I think it's a story that, like you say, not many people have seen, and uh, it's actually a very good story. I saw it on global television in Ontario, and I think it was late night. I've never seen it in color. Um, I don't know why, you, I think you were just saying that. I, I thought, Manitou? You want to talk about Manitou? <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, I think that's it. So it's a cool film, taking a chance. Well, there we go. Tony Curtis's character, Harry Erskine, mm -hmm. appears in, well, there's, I think, five Manitou novels now. I think the last one was The Blood of the Manitou. Um, so Harry plays a recurring role, and he also is in a couple other novels about a demonic djinn, uh, a genie. Oh. So Gin. you could actually do a series, well, I mean, you could actually mm -hmm. do a... <laughs> I've got to be careful what I say here, because sure as hell, somebody's going to uh, do a Harry Erskine television series, or a mini-series, where you tell the Manitou story. You have another question, Jim. Yes, this one is from Jacob in Medicine Hat. There seems to be a lot of comedic horror movies made in recent years. I feel that comedy has its place in horror, but the growing trend seems to be making comedies with some gore in them, with the emphasis being on the comedy, not the horror. What are your thoughts on this? I actually, I don't, I don't, really, I don't really like horror comedies at all, and uh, I'll be pretty blunt about it. And uh, there's only one horror comedy for me, and that is Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein in 1948. You'd quick, do a quick jump ahead, and you do the Ghostbusters. You do a little obscure film called The House, mm -hmm. House 1 and House 2. That's it for me. Everything else is a rehash, unless you want to toss in the Bob Hope's 1944 stuff like the Ghost Breakers and these kind of pictures. What about Young the Frankenstein? House. Sorry? Young Frankenstein? You know... Don't get me on Young Frankenstein. A lot of people, a lot of people like that picture. I loathe it from the moment I saw it, up to the point of, I don't like Gene Wilder. I'm going to be really blunt about it. Uh, I I think he was poor at it. Uh, I think that when he's standing up there on the the watchtower screaming, "It's alive! It's alive!" I'm going, no. Get this guy off the screen. This is an embarrassment to the genre. It's an embarrassment to Gene Wilder. I know people like Mel Brooks, but just no. Um, no, I, I will not watch that. And the uh, short answer is no. So, so you liked it then? <laughs> no. I didn't even like the opening credits. I'm sorry. And uh, I, did, I do not like that picture. Okay. From my point of view, I, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm partially to blame because I made a horror comedy. But it, it's, it's exactly like Jacob says, uh, making comedies with some gore in them. Herschel Gordon Lewis and I 
sat down and said, we want to make a modernized version of one of his films. But we wanted it to be entertaining. And if you're going to make it entertaining, it should contain satire and some comedic moments. So that you have a contrast. You can go from something heavily gory into something that'll make you laugh. And that's why I also chose an anthology. So there'd be the pacing. Now, he thought it would be all around entertainment. And I, I tended to agree. Um, I mean, if you're going to go out and make a dark horror movie, yeah, I'd make a dark horror movie. No, Myself, personally, I don't, I don't want to make dark horror. I don't, I don't feel that um, it's, it's something I want to be involved in at this point in my life. Um, in terms of something along the lines of uh, a film that is basically low budget, that is like a snuff film. Or something along those lines, where it's snuff just gore, film? gore, gore. Well, I oh, mean, snuff film, guinea pig, an American guinea pig, and things like film. that. You know, it's not my cup of tea anymore. Uh, um, the, you know, I used to enjoy things like the Vomit Gore trilogy, and August Underground, but it it, it, it it loses its appeal after a while. And as a filmmaker, I have to look at it and say, well, okay, you're you're what you're doing, is you're dealing with a subgenre of what is essentially a subgenre. And so, as Herschel always pointed out, it's called show business. It's a business, it's about money. At the end of the day, ultimately, that's what it's about. There's also a sidelight to that. There's nothing wrong in horror pictures. You have shock, 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 light moment, because you have, you, that way you make the shocks deeper. Mm -hmm. There's nothing wrong with that. I don't have, I'm not adverse to that. But an out and out horror comedy, no, it don't work. Not since those pictures that I mentioned before. And unless somebody comes up with something really interesting, other than young Frankenstein, I think it's pretty much dead. We have another question here. And this is from Joseph. Or Joseph. And his Technicolor spelled. raincoat, I see. <laughs> Do you think the horror genre has a strong enough foundation to support a new generation of film gore? <coughs> No, <laughs> uh, I'm sorry to be negative on this because we're on a platform here that we're expressing our opinions and we're, we're very lucky to do that and very privileged. We have our opinions. It doesn't mean people are going to like it. Uh, we have a good crew. We have people that are going to help us. Uh, but everybody has an opinion and whether or not it's a good opinion or a bad one, that's, that's totally subjective. What people have to do is they have to get off their rear ends. They have to learn the business from, and like you said, business. Uh, they have to learn how to make film. When you learn how to make film, if you learn how to play the piano, you learn how to play a musical instrument, I want to play jazz, I want to play blues, you don't go in and say, I want to play blues, you play the guitar. You learn the basics of the guitar, how the chords. Filmmaking, you learn how to do film. You don't say, I learned how to do a horror film. Not many are doing that. The genre, I think, is suffering because of that. Uh, I think you're getting a lot of people that perhaps require more opportunity to do it. I don't think there is an opportunity for people. Uh, if people come out and do it, take it upon themselves to learn this skill, I think it's a wonderful, wonderful thing. Okay. Well, I tend to be of exactly the same opinion. Um, it's the same with horror books or horror movies. We live in an age where it's not all that hard to go and buy a 4K camera. The, the fact that you can press record and point it does not make you a director of photography. Right. And there are too many people out there that actually do that. Yeah. It's, it's, like, it's, known to be, it's known to happen. It's like opening up a can does not make you a chef. That's right. No. That's a, well put, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know why. Maybe I'm hungry, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, and, and, yeah. and it tends to ruin. There are people who've put their dues in. Yeah. Who, who've spent a lot of time, a lot of years of their life. They're members of the union and everything else. And I'm not, not going to say I'm union or pro-union or against the union. Um, but there are people who have extensive training. And 
The problem is, and I'll be frank about this, is as a zombie film reviewer, I, I could review literally 20 a month. And what are they made by? They're made by people who think that they can go and make a zombie film. And the zombie genre is one that is very, very prone to this, where it's not particularly hard to make zombie makeup, although when you watch the films, you think it would be uh, in a lot of cases. But uh, so you have these films and people will put them on YouTube and they'll spend money to put them on DVD and that sort of thing. So you have a glut. So if a person wants to watch a good zombie movie, and I'm not saying that all independent film is, is terrible. It's certainly not. There's some great independent and pro-indie films. But how do you get found if you're that filmmaker when there's so many to choose from? And it's mm. the same with in print. You know, because you, you knock off 75 pages of a novella and you put it on Amazon doesn't mean that you're an author. Nope. Like. You know, and, and that's the problem. So if you want to, if, if you want to read a good horror novel, how do you find it amongst the thousands that are coming all the time? That's I, I agree on that, on that point. The other, the other point was, if you look at some of the, of the so-called horror pictures of today, many of them haven't, haven't a friggin' clue about how to light, how to do atmospheric lighting, uh, how to do the gothic film. If you look at some of the gothic pictures that are, are, are produced today, there are a few exceptions. Uh, one recent one was uh, the other. Uh, that was um, uh, Tom Cruise's wife. Mm -hmm. it was in Nicole that. Kidman. Yeah, Kidman. Uh, wonderful time. shot in the shot in Welsh countryside, you know, with actual fog mm -hmm. and and things. People may not like the film, but it had a good feel to it. Um, they don't they don't shoot genre very well, I think. In it, you have you know, film noir. You don't do film noir anymore. Mm. Who knows how to light black and white now? Mm, Very true. hard to do. Very hard to do artistically. You know, these are things that people learn in the B pictures and how take it upon themselves to learn skills. And well, some of it gets lost. Mm -hmm. Well, this is one of the ones we could spend an entire hour on. But we have a question now. Oh, another one. Yes, we do. Oh. Interesting. This is from Todd in Calgary. Given the current state of politics and horror being a snapshot into each generation through the years, what age of horror are we living in now? God. Uh, what, what are we living in now? Um, I get you. Politics. Late middle age? <laughs> politics and horror. Late middle age? Um, uh, you know, um, horror has gone from a strictly storytelling tradition to a literary tradition, to a stage tradition, to a film tradition, uh, exploded into internet, book, uh, painting, music now, which is huge. Uh, there's a whole huge subgenre of rockabilly, psychobilly that's out there that does all this thing. There's so many facets to it. Um, late middle age, I think, you know, are we, is it spiraling down or spiraling up? Uh, it's hard to say. Um, I would suggest that we're in a holding pattern right now. We're looking for the next, the next big thing that somebody's going to grab onto. Is it, but I get out of the question there about trying to combine the politics and the horror. Basically, the politics of today contain a lot of horror in them because politicians today in North America and, and, in, and in Europe, not so much the Asian countries, I think the, the politics, the political climate right now is about divisiveness and fear through, through mainstream media, through everything else. It's fear, fear, fear. You know, there's, there's, a, there's a conflict in the United States right now, you know, with North Korea. Well, if, when you hear on our news, what would happen if a bomb exploded over Calgary? Well, 
it's pandering to fear all the time, which I don't think is a particularly, uh, well, it's not, certainly not helpful on a, on a basic human level, but and I think uh, The Purge, the new Purge movie, I haven't seen that. Well, it covers it, it. It it covers, I think, uh, the American election. Mm -hmm. So I think I, th I think that now you're beginning to see the possibilities that happen when people on one side. It's a polarizing thing. The American president polarizes people quite strongly, and whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. Not for me to say. I'm a Canadian, um, but yeah, I mean that's that's where that's how I see it. And one final question for the day. Okay. All right. This is from Catherine. Uh, are old school special effects a dying art? With CGI so prevalent, not too many movies are being made using old special effects techniques. What are your th thoughts regarding overusage of CGI in modern horror movies? <laughs> Ray Harryhausen, uh, who was you know, uh, I, I know and remember, you know, doing, and Willis O'Brien doing King Kong, moving the little figures mm -hmm. uh, around. Jason That's and the long, Argonauts. long gone, you know, Jason and the Argonauts. They're still textbook for animators, I, I understand. Mm -hmm. But all that could be two months' work can be done within, you know, a, a day on a computer. Uh, I think it's already been, it's been documented. Uh, CGI takes over a film. You have many people that don't even follow a story that will sit there and stare at, oh, that was wonderful, or that was fake. And I always go, that was fake. Well, have you ever seen a fucking flying saucer land before? How do you know what it looks like? True. Uh, you know, have you ever seen Godzilla? You know, oh, that wasn't very good monster. Well, have you ever seen Godzilla? How do you know? This is one person's idea. Uh, I think the CGI effects totally take over uh, uh, today's horror pictures, and uh, I wish uh, I, I really wish it would change. People always say, "Oh, I don't. Uh, it's not story driven and everything." Yet you still pay your money to go and see this. Well, my thought on the whole thing is this: <sighs> another producer and I were talking the other day, and we're of a similar age. And the basic concept we talked about was it's not about us. We're older people. The, the, the predominant audience grew up with video games and CGI. Now, on a personal level, because it means so much to me growing up as a, you know, loving 80s horror, loving 60s, 70s horror, when we made Blood Mania, it is 90. I would say 98% uh, practical effects because that's what people our age are looking for. Uh, yeah, one younger. I mean, the, the authentic horror, pen, or horror fans love that stuff. I mean, but they're the ones who seek out the older stuff. What's a practical effect? Well, I, okay. Well, for me, I, I'm, I don't know what a practical effect is. Maybe. All right. Well, um, let's say. <laughs> that you uh, wanted to watch a scene where a woman is getting um, her hand nailed to a, a beam. Well, then you take a cast of the actress's hand mm -hmm. and you make sure that the flesh matches, you make sure that the nails are painted the same way, everything okay. else, all the articulation on the palms is there. Then, if she's wearing a ring or something, and you always want to try to do that, put a ring on the finger so the audience identifies that it's her hand. Then you, you know, somebody is off, off frame holding the thing while the guy drives the nail in. Okay. And uh, if you want to rip the hand or whatever, I literally stood there with a blood pump going up through the hand 
that was being pumped as I'm moving the hand back and forth so that sooner or later you're going to get the exact shot you want mm -hmm. in the editing process. And that's basically how a practical effect works. Um, when we, we, we actually recreated the scene from Scanners where a shotgun was used to blow a head apart. Well, in homage to that, we took a cast of the actor's head, put it against a green screen, and took a shotgun to it. You didn't, I'm going to suck your brain dry. <laughs> no. But, but, you know, and, and so that. th that's a practical effect. I mean, it, could you do it with CGI? Uh -huh. Yes, you could, effortlessly. The only CGI we used was with bullets. Now, we could have done squibs okay. and everything else, but squibs are very expensive now, and, and you really have to be careful because they can hurt the actor. So we thought, okay, in this instance, um, we would use CGI. Right. And one of, the th one of the reviews of the movie said there was some questionable CGI. And when I watch it, I don't see it being as questionable. But, again... It actually shows the difference between um, CGI mm -hmm. and practical. Okay. It, it points them out. We're at that part now where we're going to discuss something that we've seen recently. Yes. <laughs> yeah, what have you seen? <laughs> what have I seen? Um, uh, American Horror Story. Uh, the current edition of it, the ones that I, that I most favor... Uh, that I more, watched more extensively was uh, called Hotel mm -hmm. and Freak Show. Hotel recently uh, with Lady Gaga. Uh, she was actually voted as uh, one of the favorite teen awards or something like that as, a, as a, uh, an actor in a series, and she was very surprised when she won it. I thought she did a wonderful job. A little bit one-dimensional in some moments. Brilliant set through the whole show. An Art Deco hotel that... Okay. Uh, I think they, well, they obviously did it in a studio, uh, but outdoors they did, uh, they did an exterior. It was an Art Deco uh, place in New York uh, that they did. Uh, I think you'll have to research on the net where it was. But uh, a brilliant show. Um, brought in some of the, uh, uh, the vampirism ideas. There was uh, heavy sexuality as in most of the uh, uh, American uh, horror story uh, ways that they set up. They used the continuing cast very well. Mm -hmm. uh, I thought, uh, uh, again, a worthy addition of it. Uh, previous to that, Freak Show, Freak Show was uh, uh, essentially a, a cast used uh, quite well. Um, there was some, we were talking before about uh, CGI, the, how they did a CGI with a female actor with two heads. Uh, okay. she, uh, she was the, uh, uh, the freak. I don't really like using that term. Uh, I think it leads the way in, uh, in television horror. Uh, it's the only program that I think on TV, besides the news, that has more graphic content and should have a warning about it. Oh, I, I, up until now, Penny Dreadful, I would have given that to you. Uh, mine for the week, uh, well, it's, I watched the, uh, the new series that Spike did. Uh, uh, I recently saw it on Netflix, uh, The Mist based upon the uh, novella by Stephen King. I loved The Mist. That is one of my favorite stories um, that King ever wrote, uh, a, a novella. King writes? Not lately, but he has been known to. Okay. Um, he um, wrote this great story, which reminded me of uh, a novel um, called The Fog. It was written by James Herbert many years ago. Yeah. Anyway, they made it into a film with Thomas Jane, and it was fine. I, I enjoyed it. It was pretty good, except they changed the ending. It wasn't as dark as... Uh, it was darker than the actual ending, which I guess for cinematic purposes uh, it worked or it didn't. Um, this new miniseries, I couldn't wait for it to end. Ten hours, and they had it perfect. I mean, as far as the series goes... If you look at um, amortization, and making it uh, a little bit more affordable, instead of having uh, the action take place in one store, it takes place in a mall, which makes perfect sense because if it's an ongoing series, you have many more characters that you can develop. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, the gore was pretty good. Uh, 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 gore. Well, I, the, the shock value, the gore, yeah. was, was, was good. I have a question mm -hmm. on that point. Um, Stephen King, uh, years ago, acknowledged that he was the uh, hamburger, french fries, and beer guy of, uh, of horror fiction. Mm -hmm. uh, he also, I believe he said at one point that he used to drink a lot of alcohol and write and listen to ACDC when he was... Uh, when he was uh, doing stuff. It's a hell of a job if you, you know, can get it. This is, this, is, this is what he said in his formative years. I have always thought that Stephen King overwrites his stuff. I have always thought Mr. Rod Serling did it a lot better. Uh, he would come on with something in two pages that takes King 400 pages to do. Um, I don't know some people like that. Maybe they, they consider it a background on things, but uh, for me well, I, I think Mr. King has gotten to the point in his career where editors are afraid to touch him. And I stopped fairly quickly after reading Lisey's story. I, I quit. So that's what we have this week. Yes. The Mist, if you must watch it, watch it. I mean, it's, it's, it's an okay way to spend 10 hours of your life, but it's very disappointing in, in terms of character development and anything that would entice you to watch the next episode. American Horror Story. Scare your pants off. Thanks for coming. Next time, we're going to have a Halloween episode. So, and we'll have a, a guest with us. His name is Dave Trainer. He is a practical effects wizard. To show you, uh, talk about some of the work he's done in movies like Blade II, uh, Fargo, the TV series, that sort of thing. Thank you for being here. We will see you next time. Pumpkins are on us. Thank you.